my topic is the first thesis. And before we get to the thesis, number one, as representative and as a window into the 95 theses, let's look to God's Word. The text before us is Luke chapter 18. It's a parable, begins in verse 9, and we will read through to verse 14. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. And I think as I read these words, you might be able to see the connection uh, to Luther and the connection to the posting of the 95 Theses. I hope that becomes clear as we look at this text. Christ also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who calls himself, I'm sorry, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In that parable of two praying men, we can see a little bit of teeing up of Luther and the Roman church. There's, on the one hand, that which thinks it's already righteous, and that thinking of already being righteous stems from the commitment to the practices. And so the appeal is to what they do. You can't also but miss there's a sense in which there's a rather high regard for the self on behalf of the Pharisee. Not only is there an appeal to what they do, but they are rather self-congratulatory about what they are capable of. On the other hand, there's this tax collector. Now, Luther was not a tax collector. In fact, I don't think he had much respect regard for tax collectors at all, as I understand his writings. He was a monk, but certainly on this point he could agree with the tax collector that there's only one thing he can appeal to, and that is the mercy of God. We'll see that as we come to these 95 theses. In fact, the 95 theses themselves tell a tale. They tell a tale of two ways. One is the way that Luther, and I don't think he's quite there. If you heard Dr. Godfrey's lecture earlier, he's referencing Luther's conversion likely to 1518, 1519, somewhere in there. There's a little debate over Luther's conversion, the date of his conversion, but I don't think he's converted when he pens this text that we are all celebrating in this 500th anniversary year. But he's certainly knocking on the door and he's certainly headed in the right direction. And so, there's two ways in the 95 Theses. The one is the path of looking to God's Word and therefore finding within God's Word the words of eternal life. The other, the other path is the path of the Roman church. In fact, the Reformation may very well be summed up in the first two Theses of the 95 Theses. Now, I don't know if you have your copy with you. I don't know why you would come to Wittenberg without your copy of the 95 Theses. And if you need a copy, you can go down to the Castle Church and you can take off the 2,200-pound 2, bronze doors and bring them in here. And if you can read Latin, you'll be just fine. 
I brought a paper edition of the 95 Theses myself. First thesis says this. When our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, said, repent, he intended that the entire life of believers should be of repentance. Now, the importance here, and don't miss it, is that he starts off with a biblical text. The very first thesis, Luther's headed in the right direction. He's knocking on the right door, and he's going down the right path. He's quoting from Matthew 4, 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach. Now, when I read something like that, I don't know about you, but my first thought is, what's he preaching? I really want to know. And so Matthew tells us, saying, here's his sermon. In a nutshell, he had one main point. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is where Luther begins. And he begins with that word, repent. Now, in the second thesis, we see the other path, the second path, the path of the church to which he belonged, the church of which he was a member, and it was a path that was headed in the wrong direction. He says in thesis number two, the word repentance cannot be understood to mean the sacrament of penance or the act of confession and satisfaction administered by the priests. Now, how is Luther able to arrive at this conclusion so lucidly? We have to back up a year, 1516. It was in that year that Erasmus of Rotterdam, the humanist, and as Luther will say, he commends Erasmus because he sees the fault within the church, but he fears that Erasmus does not go far enough in embracing the truth. Erasmus recognized the church to be wrong, but he never came to embracing the doctrines of the Reformation and the truth of the gospel. In fact, he's going to toe off with Luther on the subject of the will in 1525. But back in 1516, Erasmus is doing a very important work. He's in the city of Basel, and there in Basel, he's laboring and brings together for the first time the publication of the Greek New Testament. It's an addition with the Latin on one side and the Greek text on the other. That is quite a feat for a publisher to pull off in 1516. And a copy of that makes its way to Luther. And he's looking at the Greek text of Matthew 4.17. And he's looking side by side at the Latin text of Matthew 4.17. And the Latin text for the word, English word, repent, is penitentium agate. Which if we translate that, I don't know what it is into German, what it is into English, do penance. Do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Well, Luther's looking at the Greek word, metanoia. It's nothing to do with penance, not even remotely close to penance. And so Luther understands that this entire doctrine, tradition within the Roman church of penance is not biblical. And so he says it very clearly clearly in thesis number two. This word repentance cannot be understood to mean penance. It was through this path of God's word that Luther would eventually be led into the truth of the gospel. In fact, if we back up and look at the preface to the 95 Theses, we see what's motivating Luther, what's pushing Luther. The preface reads, out of love for the truth and the desire to bring it to light. The following propositions, all 95 of them, The following propositions will be discussed at Wittenberg under the oversight of the Reverend Father Martin Luther, Master of Arts and of Sacred Theology, and lecturer on these subjects at Wittenberg. It's very important that Luther says both of those things. He is at once a pastor. He was ordained back in the town of Erfurt, and when he came here to Wittenberg, he began preaching 
1512, he began preaching sermons in St. Mary's Church. He preached in that church from 1512 through 1546 for 34 years. He was preaching in this town with some interruptions from time to time, you know, being exiled to a castle and whatnot. So with some interruptions, but he was a preacher. And in 1517, he was a preacher. And as a preacher, he was, in that understanding of things, he was obligated for the souls of his congregation. And this indulgence sale, this sale that was authorized by Albert of Mainz, and he was going against canon law by having multiple bishoprics, one extending pretty close to Halle. But in order to do that, he needed a papal dispensation, and so there was a little bit of negotiation going on with Leo X. Meanwhile, back in Rome, Leo X is having difficulties of his own. He and the Pope prior to him have exhausted the treasuries of the church in building up St. Peter's Basilica. Luther's going to call it out by name in the 95 Theses. And so Leo has a problem. He has a, a depleted treasury, and he's in need of funds. And Albert has a problem he is going against church law, and he needs a dispensation. And these two need each other. And so a deal is struck. These are good businessmen. They negotiate. The Pope asks for 12,000 ducats, presumably one for every of the 12 apostles. Albert, he's a good businessman. He counters with 7,000, one for each of the seven deadly sins. And after all, it's the art of compromise, so they settle on 10,000, presumably for the Ten Commandments, and money passes hands. But this was borrowed money from the, the Pfluger family, the banking family here in Germany. Albert's money was in land, not necessarily in cash. And now he has to pay back this huge debt that he has just now accrued. But he has this enterprising monk named Tetzel, and Tetzel comes up with even a marketing jingle. It rhymes in German, clinked and sprinked, and it rhymes in English, clings and springs. When a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. It's very clever. He also knew how to manipulate a crowd. He would write up these sermons and send them out to preachers, and they would preach of the tortures of purgatory. And then he would come into town, and he would say, do you hear that? Do you hear the cries of your grandmother in purgatory? And you hold on, you greedy person holding on to your coins. Why, if you just throw those coins into the coffer, your grandmother will be released from purgatory. And you too can be released from purgatory. You can buy your way out of purgatory. Sometimes we say, that this indulgence sale was buy your way out of hell. No, it wasn't. You weren't in fear of hell. You were in fear of purgatory. See, at baptism, the stain of original sin was removed, and so hell was off the table. But purgatory was on the table because you still had sins, stains attached to you, and you had to be purged of them. But you can buy your way out of that through this indulgence sale. And so Luther's parishioners cross the Elba River and they go over into the regions where Albert's priests and Tetzel's priests, colleagues, monks are selling indulgences and they come back and Luther is a pastor and he's responsible for their soul and he's calling them on the carpet for their public sins and they reach into their pocket and they pull out their indulgence slip. And how can Luther, a monk, go against his pope? So when Luther says that I am the Reverend Father Martin Luther, he's saying I'm, I'm seeking the truth because I have an obligation for the people of Wittenberg who are my flock. And then he says I'm a lecturer of sacred theology at Wittenberg. He was a doctor. This is an office that the church instituted, the doctor of theology. These were the heavy lifters intellectually who would keep the church on track 
They were the ones who were shipped off to the university and devoted their lives to studying so that they would know what the church believed and they could hold the church to its teachings. And so Luther, as a doctor of the church, had an obligation to his church, and when he saw something awry, he spoke up. When he comes to write the first of the three treatises in 1520, he's going to say, the time for silence has passed. The time to speak out has come. It's true of the indulgence sale. Now, as we get into the 95 Theses, and I hope you read them, you know what's going to happen. You're going to die, and you're going to show up at the gate, and you're going to be met by St. Peter, and he's going to say, why should I let you into heaven? And you're going to say, well, because I trust in Christ. He's going to say, great, you can come in. And he's going to say, oh, by the way, have you read the 95 Theses? Now, see, be very careful how you answer that question because it will, it will determine where you end up in the new heavens and the new earth. So if you want a really nice place, read the 95 Theses. And I hope you know that I'm joking about all of that. But you're going to meet Luther, you're going to see him in heaven, he's going to talk to you eventually, might as well not be embarrassed that you never read his 95 Theses. But as he's working through these 95 Theses, and as he's engaging them, he's beginning to realize more and more that something's awry. Now, as you read them, you'll see that he's affirming a lot within the Roman Catholic Church. He's actually affirming indulgences. He's rejecting this indulgence sale. He's affirming purgatory, and he's affirming papal authority. There's an awful lot in the 95 theses that he's affirming. What he is going after is the particular very blatant abuse that has happened under Leo and through the machinations of Albert and Tetzel. So he's still not quite there, but he is raising questions. Well, as we roll through some of these theses, we can see some of the things Luther's up to. In thesis number 21, he says, therefore, those preachers of indulgences are in error who say that by the Pope's indulgences, a man is freed from every penalty and is saved. These preachers of indulgences are going too far. Ultimately, indulgences belong to God. They don't belong to the Pope. And so the preachers are in error. In number 27, he'll say, they preach man-made doctrines who say that so soon as the coin jingles, there it is, clinked in the German, into the money box, the soul flies, sprinked out of purgatory. It is certain that when the coin jingles into the money box, greed and avarice can be increased. But the result of the intercession of the church is in the power of God alone. Here's something that's very important that's underlying the surface here. This is where it ties back into the parable of Luke 18. Luther is challenging the presumption of the medieval Roman Catholic Church. He's challenging the presumption of the Pope, the presumption of the church's practice of her sacraments. It's the presumption that simply by doing it, we will get the result. It's the presumption that simply by asserting it, it will be. And not recognizing that there are two missing ingredients. He's going to come to say this in a sermon he preaches right over there at St. Mary's Church on Palm Sunday in 1518 called Two Kinds of Righteousness. And that presumption is the lack of of faith, that the sacraments are simply performed and there's no discussion of faith. And in two kinds of righteousness, Luther will say, the forgiveness of sins, the becoming righteousness, is not through the sacraments automatically. The ingredient is faith. And then the presumption that the Pope has the authority to declare this, not recognizing that the Pope is on borrowed authority, that of God and His Word. 
when Luther says that intercession of the church is in the power of God alone, he is calling his church to be humble, to be humble before God and to not be presumptuous. Do you not see it in the parable of the Pharisee? I fast, I follow the rules, I do this, I do that. That guy doesn't. Surely I'm righteous. In fact, isn't this what Jesus says? He told the parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That's presumption. And Luther sees it in his own church. And he calls his church on it. One of the saddest of the theses to me is thesis number 56. Here in thesis number 56, Luther says, the treasures of the church out of which the Pope grants indulgences are not simply named or known among the people of Christ. To be sure, there are the treasures of the church. And the Roman medieval church is saying, this is what the treasures of the church are. In fact, we'll explain this in a minute. It's, a, it's, a, it's an expression of an understanding in medieval Catholicism about the saints and their merits. And so the church is teaching this about the treasures. And what Luther is saying, here's the tragedy of the moment in which we find ourselves in 1517. The true treasures of the church are not simply known or taught among the people of God because the church has abdicated its place and the Bible is absent. And when the Bible is absent, the gospel is absent. Is this not a sad thing? The true treasures of the church, they're not sufficiently named and they're not known among the people. This is what is troubling Luther. This is what is troubling him in terms of his role as a pastor and his role as a theologian. That something's missing here. And it's not just something, it's the thing. And it's missing. The church believed that sins were in the, a quantity. Remember, at baptism, the original, the stain of original sin is removed. So at the sacrament of baptism, that's undoing Adam's original sin. So now the issue in life is sins, plural. And if the issue is sins in the plural, then when you get to grace, it's not a quantitative thing, it's a qualitative thing. It becomes grace is. And now we have the whole penitential system. You need more graces than you have sins. You need more merits than you have demerits. But you have a lot of demerits. And you have very few graces because you're, you know, common, ordinary people. But every once in a while, there comes along someone who has more graces than they need, and they become saints. And their graces are not wasted. They're accumulated, and they go into a treasury in heaven. And at the top of that chain of saints, there's Jesus' mother, Mary, full of grace which is understood as a quantity in this understanding. It's a biblical expression, but it's totally misunderstood and therefore abused. And she has more grace than she needs. And all of these graces are up in a treasure chest somewhere in heaven, literally. And guess who has the keys? If you've ever seen the papal symbol, it always has the crossed keys. And the keys are the entrance to that treasure chest and the entrance to the kingdom of heaven itself. So if you want to get to heaven, you have to go through the church and you have to go through her system. And that's the treasure. That's the teaching of the church. You know what Luther says? Number 62. The true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. Now this sounds like Luther's right there, doesn't it? sounds about as over the plate as you can get, but I don't think he's still quite there. Still not talking about imputation. He's still not talking about justification. He's still holding on to some of the trappings of the church. He's going to get there very quickly. 
And the next year, he's going to get there. But you see what he's doing? He's going down the right path. He's reading the Word of God, and he's finding within the Word of God the words of eternal life, the gospel. And he's seeing the exact opposite in the other path. And in the other path is the traditions of men, and they do not lead to life, but they lead to a path of death. It was true of the first century Pharisees. They trusted in themselves for righteousness. It was true of the 16th century Roman Catholic Church that it was trusting in itself and in its own righteousness. And by God's mercy, as Luther would say, 500 years ago, God used a monk and his mallet to walk out of the Augustinian cloister and down a cobblestone street to the church doors of the Schlosskirche and post the 95 Theses and begin to return the church back to Scripture to replace that absence with the presence of the Word of God and to make it central to the practice of the church. And as that word of God was restored to the church, the light of the gospel broke forth into the darkness. And once again, people were taught, and they were taught the truth, and they were taught the truth that leads to eternal life. At the end of the 95 Theses, Luther's going to say, away with the false prophets, quoting Jeremiah, who say, peace, peace, and there is no peace. It's a false gospel, empty promise. Instead, listen to the prophet who says, cross, cross, and there is no cross. This is beautiful. There is no cross for us, see, because Christ did it. He bore the penalty of our sin. He bore the cross. As Luther is going to say in that Palm Sunday sermon in 1518, the righteousness of Christ swallows up our sin. And it no longer exists because we are found in Him and we are found in Christ alone. If you've never read the 95 Theses, remember to do so. You don't want to be embarrassed when you meet Martin Luther. And as we think back on this important document and we think back upon how God used this monk and this document, may we be humbled. But more importantly, may we be driven to God's word and may we join not with the Pharisee who trusts in our own righteousness, who trusts in how we have it all buttoned up and have it together, but may we be found side by side with the tax collector. And may we too have a bowed head and may we say, Lord, have mercy. And there we will meet a merciful God in Christ our Savior. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we're grateful for this Reverend Father Martin Luther, this lecture on sacred theology. We're grateful for his boldness and his courage. We're grateful for his mind and his ability to reflect. We're grateful that you used him and that you were merciful to him. As we think back of the 500 years, may we also look ahead. And may we have that same clarity and that same boldness as we preach that same gospel. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.